three, two. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon and welcome to our weekly media briefing and public health update with Montgomery County Executive Mark Elrich. I'm Lorna Vigili, Hispanic Public Information Officer for the county, and joining us today is Dr. Keisha Davis, the county's health officer, as well as Dr. James Bridgers, Director of the Department of Health and Human Services, Mr. Sean O'Donnell, Acting Deputy Chief of Public Health Services, for the Department of Health and Human Services, Dr. Earl Strader, Assistant Chief, Administrative Officer, and we have two special guests today. Jody Finkelstein, who is Executive Director, Montgomery County Commission for Women, and Executive Director, Human Trafficking Prevention Committee. Joining us as well is Montgomery County Police Department, Investigative Services, Assistant Chief, Nick Agustin. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Mr. County Executive, good afternoon to you. Uh, good afternoon, and uh, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, yesterday, the county recognized January as Human Trafficking Awareness Month, and we were talking about trafficking. We know we're talking about both sex slavery and also trafficking people into labor slavery. Human traffickers often take advantage of people, including minors who are vulnerable, and traffickers use force, fraud, and coercion to entrap adults and youth into trafficking, and youth who are trafficked are often manipulated into traumatizing situations. Far too many victims suffer for too long without getting the help they need. Many times, victims do not know they are being trafficked, so it's hard for them to ask for help. Since 2007, the United States National Human Trafficking Hotline has received more than 400,000 tips and help more than 30,000 victims and survivors. And over the past few years, they reported a steady increase in calls directly from those needing help. Montgomery County has a Human Trafficking Prevention Committee that began as a task force in 2014 and has evolved into an important tool bringing together law enforcement and partner agencies that are dedicated advocates looking to help victims and to shut down the brutal networks that benefit from this modern day slavery. I want to welcome in two um, guests today who can talk more about our efforts in the county to combat human trafficking. Nick Augustine is an assistant chief with Montgomery County Police Department, and Jody Finkelstein is the executive director, director of Montgomery County's Commission for Women in a leading advocate for raising awareness about human trafficking in our area and state. And the Commission for Women is actually preparing for its annual women's legislation later briefing that's happening this Sunday at the universities of Shady Grove and Rockville. So I'm gonna ask her to talk about both subjects um, along with uh, Nick before, let's start, start with Nick before Jody follows up and then we'll take your questions on human trafficking. All right, good afternoon. Uh, County Executive First, thank you for having us uh, today and taking your stance to prevent human trafficking. It's important to note that human trafficking requires a comprehensive and multifaceted approach. And police efforts are just one part of the larger strategy. Collaboration and coordination among various stakeholders to include intergovernment departments, nonprofit organizations, and regional law enforcement partners are essential to effectively address this global problem. Specifically, Montgomery County Police focuses on conducting investigations to identify and dismantle human trafficking networks. Our missing children investigators thoroughly debrief our runaway children to determine if there is any relation to human trafficking. Additionally, investigators can monitor open online networks uh, where trafficking can be facilitated. Once a victim of human trafficking is located, Montgomery County Police is committed to providing support to the victim to ensure their safety and connecting them with the social service resources. Outside of investigating these crimes, providing education for our officers and the community is paramount. By recognizing signs of human trafficking and knowing how to respond can be the key to helping a victim. Finally, before um, finally, a big thing is building the trust with the communities is essential for effective prevention. Montgomery County Police engages with communities to raise awareness, gather information, and encourage reporting of suspicious activities related to human trafficking. Human trafficking cannot be solved by just police alone, social services, or a nonprofit organization. It will take an entire community to ensure no matter who you are in Montgomery County, you can live free and safe without the fear of exploitation. We ask that anyone that suspects trafficking to contact the Montgomery County Police at 301-279-8000 or 
or the National Human Trafficking Hotline at 888-373-7888. Thank you very much, Jody. Uh, thank you, thank you, County Executive. Thank you, Assistant Chief. Thank you all for being here today. Um, again, my name is Jody Finkelstein with the Montgomery County Human Trafficking Prevention Committee and the Montgomery County Commission for Women. Um, we started this task force, we originally started this as a task force and it transitioned to a committee just a few years ago. So while we've done a great deal, we still have a long way to go. Um, in the next few minutes, I just really wanted to outline the four W's of human trafficking, who, what, where, and why. Um, first, I want to provide a definition of what human trafficking is. Um, traffickers use fraud, force, fraud, and coercion to entrap their victims, to compel them to work in exploitive conditions for the traffickers' enrichment. And I want to highlight that this is very different than what is done with youth. There does not need to be any fraud, fraud force, or coercion to have, to have that happen. And that can either be in sex trafficking or labor trafficking. Why? Why does human trafficking occur? It occurs because there's a demand. There's a demand for people, either for sex or for labor. Um, and there's still a demand, unfortunately, for all of this to occur, occur um, because we still don't have enough um, resources to be able to help the victims. So it continually occurs. Who does it happen to? It happens to everybody. It can happen to men, it can happen to women, it can happen to children as well. Um, how does this occur? Again, it occurs through fraud, fraud force, and coercion. Um, and just going back to the who for one moment, there's actually a myth that it only occurs to people that uh, ha are coming in from overseas or immigrants. While the part of that might be true, I want to emphasize that trafficking can occur to anybody, especially vulnerable adults um, in America. And where does it happen? Again, this can happen. It does happen in Montgomery County, um, which many people are uh, uh, don't know about. Um, so I want to emphasize it is happening right here in our own backyard. It can happen in people's homes. It can happen in hotels. It can happen in business establishments. Um, and one of the things that the Human Traffic and Prevention Committee is working on, in particular with uh, Health and Human Services and with the police department, is to ensure and crack down on illicit businesses who are fronting as either massage entities or body works entities when in fact they are um, supporting human trafficking. So again, that's the who, what, where, why um, of human trafficking. Uh, the Human Trafficking Prevention Committee is comprised of three commit subcommittees, our Legislative Committee, our Education Committee, um, our Education Outreach Committee, I'm sorry, and our Victim Services. Um, some of the initiatives that we've been working on around education and outreach is training. We have done a tremendous job training not only law enforcement, but fire and rescue, and we're currently working with Montgomery County Public Schools to train teachers to be able to identify human trafficking, potential human trafficking, and children. With Victim Services, we're working very hard to do more outreach around sex trafficking and labor trafficking. And legislatively, we work with the state trafficking task force. Um, and we also work with the county executive and uh, county council to pass local laws related to human trafficking. Um, I wanna reiterate what the assistant chief said if individuals need help. Um, if you need help, the number to call locally is 240-777-4357 or if you have a tip and think their trafficking may be going on and need assistance, that national number again is 888-373-7888. Thank you very much. Um, if you would like to learn more about human trafficking, you can do so by either attending um, any one of our meetings which are open to the public or by attending our the Commission for Women's Women's Legislative Briefing that's this weekend. Um, it's taking place at the Universities of Shady Grove, and we have numerous uh, seminars related to uh, this issue, which will also include domestic violence and sexual assault, and we invite all of you to cover it, and we invite the public to attend. Again, that's happening this Sunday um, at the Universities of Shady Grove, um, beginning at 1230 and ending at 5. Um, I do want to make a quick point that we are providing free child care for individuals that would like to attend. So we encourage families um, to come and learn more about the issues pertaining to um, women and families um, under this year's theme from proposal to passage. 
um, collaborating for justice and equality. Thank you very much. Members of the media, we're going to open it up right now for questions regarding human trafficking. All of the questions towards the end of this presentation, human trafficking questions, and I see Suzanne Pollack from my MC Media has her hand up. Go ahead, Susan. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. Do we have any numbers, for instance, how many arrests in Montgomery County? How many arrests have been made? Or how, you know, and also, do we know like, locate, locate, is it more often in hotels? Is it more often in certain towns? Do we have any Montgomery County specific information? Thanks. Thank you for the question. So I can say for 2023, we're having approximately 30 cases that we have investigated, but that is a very low number. This is an extremely underreported uh, crime uh, as it deals, as it targets many people in our community. And without the education of knowing they're being trafficked or anything like that, it's very um, uh, low number. So we expect a lot more, and that's why we do a lot of proactive education and going out and doing investigations, as well as location around the county. It can be anywhere geographically in this county. We have seen all the way from up county to down county, from hotels to massage parlors. There's many different locations that it's affecting. So we ask the community just to, if you do see something, notify us of this, because you don't know where it's going to be occurring in the community. And if you do have a suspicion, just contact us so we can investigate it. Thank you, Assistant Chief. Members of the media, any other questions regarding human trafficking? Please raise your hand. No other questions regarding human trafficking? Okay. Thank you, Assistant Chief Augustine and uh, Jody Finkelstein for joining us this afternoon. You may remain on the call if you'd like to. If not, you're free to go. <laughs> Thank you for joining us today. Mr. Okay, County well Executive. So thank you all. Over the next several months, you're going to see Human Trafficking Prevention Committee's educational outreach ads across the county. And uh, you see one of them up here. They've been on ride on buses for the last few months, raising awareness about human trafficking. And I'm proud of the work in the county that we've done on this to shine a spotlight on the issue. I remember when I was uh, on the council and we were first discussing this, one of the first cases was somebody who was uh, an immigrant working for a household. And uh, they came here and the household had aided in their coming here. And then the household wouldn't let them out of the house. Um, they didn't pay them the required wages. And if they went for help or anything, they were threatened that if they did that, that they would be deported back to where they came from. And that's the way they were able to keep these people in servitude to them. And that's, you know, it's kind of a scary thing. And you think about it's happening in our own neighborhoods. It does happen. It's a real thing. Um, I really am proud of the work we do, and there are phone numbers we'd like to share with you in the audience. First is the 24-hour crisis line, and that's 240-777-4357 or 777-HELP. And that puts you in touch with our Victim Assistance and Sexual Assault Program. And we also have available through a national hotline at uh, 1-888-373-7888. Um, the battle over abortion rights and women's health care is going to be back in front of the Supreme Court in a new way this year. Anti-abortion groups um, have sued to allow the FDA authorization, I never get this right, mifepristone, uh, one of the two drugs most commonly used for medication-induced abortions. Uh, lower courts have issued a ruling, which is currently on hold, that would threaten access to the drug across the country. In September, the Supreme Court said it will review the case with a ruling expected before the court recesses this summer. The Center for Reproductive Rights points out that the Supreme Court has never invalidated a longstanding FDA approval like they're being asked to do in this case. And I can't think of anything more outrageous than a bunch of people with absolutely zero knowledge of medicine making a decision about what or what not a woman should have access to in terms of their personal health care. Um, it is mind-boggling they would even consider this, and given the people on the court. Uh, I hope it's not as frightening as it seems at first glance, because this is not an area where they should go. The drug has been used for, for nearly 5 million patients across the country since it was cleared in the year 2000. 
That's why Montgomery County is going to stand with other municipalities to fight this move by anti-abortion activists. Our county attorney <clears throat> is joining the public rights um, project's amicus brief to be filed in the Supreme Court to challenge the abortion medication ban. Then anticipated nearly 100 local governments will be part of that effort. Montgomery County joined the public rights project's amicus brief that was filed this past summer in the same case pending before the United States Circuit Court of Appeals for the Fifth Court. In Maryland this fall, women's reproductive rights are going to be on the ballot. This week, Maryland's First Lady, Dawn Moore, led the charge to get voters um, energized to codify protections in the Maryland state constitution. That rally happened of what would have been the 51st anniversary of Roe v. v. Wade. Um, Governor Moore has given the University of Maryland Medical Systems permission to stockpile mifepristone in case it is pulled from the market. He has vowed that um, to expand access to reproductive health in the state of Maryland. And it's important today, as it always has been, for the state of Maryland and Montgomery County to be a safe haven for women and for abortion access. And women's health is not something that should be decided in courts. There are too many places across the nation where women now have no local op options or face prosecution over health choices. They should retain control over their bodies without government interference. Um, these efforts will support that. And just be clear, we have no right to legislate on what a woman does with her body. Zero right to do that. And it's one of the reasons we actually need to pass the Equal Rights Amendment so nobody can hide behind the fig leaf that somehow women have less rights than men. And I dare say the men wouldn't put up with this nonsense for two seconds. And so why we think we can impose it on women is a little bit beyond me. I want to talk briefly about a big project that I was excited to help celebrate in East County. Um, the New Sprouts Farmer's Market is now open in Burtonsville Crossing Shopping Center in East County. The new store is a product of a lot of hard work over many years. It's one of the series of improvements for the East County that many people have been waiting for and they've had a hand in. When I was on the County Council, this and many other East County projects were stuck. They just were not moving. They were on paper, but none of them was actually under construction and they'd stayed that way for a long time. My team and I worked with the developers in the community to iron out the issues that were blocking progress on these projects. And we were able to get a lot done despite COVID. Together, we helped develop a plan for the kind of revitalization that benefits everyone in East County. More development is coming to town center on 29. There'll be a grocery store there, something people have been waiting for and gateway on New Hampshire Avenue that is underway as well. We've also worked with Montgomery College to get an East County Education Center started in the future, and we will see a full Montgomery County campus in East County in the future as well. East County has been seriously neg neglected for a long time, and I used to live on 198 when a car would come by about every 20 minutes. It was so peaceful to sit on my front porch back then. Not that way now. It's a uh, growing community that has desperately wanted to see revitalization and there's more in the works, including a flash expansion to our bus rapid transit network to Burtonsville and to put it as part of our expanded BRT network and also working to put this in dedicated lanes so it actually functions like BRT. These new developments are going to be a big boost for the region. They lead to local jobs and more choices as consumers. Sprouts is a specially, special kind of grocery store, and this is the company's first Maryland store in the D.C. region. And I hope it's also a sign to investors that we're serious about economic development across our county, including the East County. And I would add that the long stuck project at Viva White Oak has a new master developer, and that project is also going forward, and we're in conversations with the developer to make sure that we put things in place that assure the success of their project. I want to thank our state lawmakers for helping fund these improvements. It's the community that benefits the most and deserves the most thanks for their participation, persistence, and the input that made this possible. This week, you might have caught an update on Sergeant Patrick Kep, the Montgomery County Police Department officer who was severely injured when he was targeted by an aggressive driver on I-270 last fall. Sergeant Kep lost both of his lower legs and he was going, to, he was going through physical therapy at Walter Reed Medical Center um, over the last month. And he's gonna be getting therapy for a while. On Saturday, Sergeant Kep was recognized by the Baltimore Ravens 
during their playoff game against the Houston Texans. Sergeant Kep is a longtime Ravens fan whose service to our community was applauded by fans there and also those who saw the social media posts about him. And we wish him the best in his recovery. We're going to keep you updated on our efforts at the state level to ensure that dangerous driving on our roads is met with harsher penalties in the future to keep our officers and communities safe. Um, typically for this kind of insane driving, somebody gets a traffic violation. They put people's lives at risk. They endanger people. In this case, they actually seriously injured people. And that kind of driving needs to be elevated from a traffic offense to a criminal offense. And we're hoping that the legislature does this and takes it serious so that these clowns get the idea that they're not going to get a slap on the wrist, but they're actually could mind doing time in jail, which would be appropriate. Uh, finally, COVID-19 is still with us. Um, I just tested negative after a six-day bout with it, and it was fortunate my experience was mild. It made me glad that I got my booster and that Paxlovid was available to help treat it. Um, I never really had serious symptoms, runny nose, sniffles, and a little bit of fatigue but no sore throat, none of the things I had the first time around with this. So it was nice uh, to get the kinder, gentler version of COVID this time. Uh, we continue to see in the county and state a confluence of COVID cases, RSV cases, and the flu. A note from the county's health team called it very active, which it is. I know a lot of people, a lot of people who've gotten COVID recently, fortunately, most of them with mild cases. Transmission of respiratory diseases remains high, even after the holidays when we expect the surge. And COVID continues to be the most lethal. This trio of elderly and people who are immune compromised, compromised are the most vulnerable. Um, I just want to add that, you know, I, I, I get that most of these cases are mild, but there are portions of our population for whom getting COVID is more than a mild experience. And, you know, I kept myself home and I kept myself, um, you know, incub incubated as well. I kept myself on the reps because, you know, I might have been able to go out and do whatever I wanted to do and not feel too bad about it. But I'm not comfortable with going out and then being able to spread this to other people. I think, you know, we have to think about not just how mild it is for us, but remember there are people around us for whom this is a much more challenging disease. And I'd encourage everybody to think about that. If you get COVID, take it seriously and make sure you minimize exposure to other people. And with that, um, hospital stays tied to respiratory issues declining locally and across the state, which is good news. And this chart, you can see hospital stays statewide are down from a peak of 530 to below 400 and a drop of nearly 30%. And I hope this is a sign that the worst of this is behind us this year. Um, take care of yourself. Get your immunizations if you haven't already, and I'll turn it over to my health team now for any comments before I open it up to questions from you. Uh, thank you, Mr. County Executive. Uh, again, just uh, as he just shared, we are still at a, a very elevated level of COVID, flu, um, and RSV, though we've seen over this week, we've seen those numbers uh, begin to decline. Um, what just a word of caution in the past we we've sometimes see a bounce back uh as uh children go back to school after the the winter break um so we haven't seen that yet but it is possible that that could happen um that pre covid that happened with influenza in 2019 um and we've seen that happen in in, in recent years with covid um but right now it's encouraging to see those numbers go down um and uh, again we're we're happy to see that folks are testing and um, isolating when when they're ill. That really is the key to reducing future um, or, or additional uh, exposures and, and illnesses. So um, that's all I have for, for this week. Uh, I, I don't, um, you know, I don't think we need to go into the specific numbers, but we are, we are seeing our hospitalizations uh, for flu and, and COVID um, begin to decline as well as our, our emergency room visits. Dr. Davis, Dr. Bridgers, Dr. Stoddard, you guys have remarks? Ready for Q&A from, from, from my end. Nothing additional from me, thanks. All right, here we go, questions. All righty then, let's get started. Members of the media, Q&A. Any questions you may have regarding open topics, please raise your hand on the chat and we'll all call on you.
Okay, Kyle Swenson, Washington Post. Good afternoon, Kyle. Go ahead. Hey, thank you. I wonder if the county executive uh, could respond to the um, situation with the school superintendent as well as the IG report that was released. Yeah, I can I can respond to this. Um, I'm not very happy with the way this thing's being handled. You know, we can assume because the superintendent said so that she was asked to leave. Um, none of us know any of the reasons for why. I mean, we can speculate what it is, but the amount of information that we have right now is minimal. Obviously, the school board hasn't shared anything with us that would lead us to understand this. Uh, we don't know whether it's tied to the Bidelman issue or whether it's something separate. Um, and that, you know, makes it very hard to evaluate, you know, what the decision was based on. I, I've read the report and the report's distressing. Um, but if you look at the report and you look at the dates when the school system was alerted to things, these things go back a while. You know, they talk about four reports that were submitted, you know, from 2019 forward. And while it mentions them, and it says these reports were sent to MCPS, MCPS is a huge organization. I'm interested in where it went in MCPS, you know, at what level did the information go to and where did the information go from there? Um, and we can't answer that question for many of these. And, you know, it's hard to judge who did what if we're not getting basic answers to who saw the information and, and who decided to act or not act on that basis. The same thing goes for the accusations that appeared in the paper from a worker who said they were ordered to change uh, the recommendation regarding Dr. Bidelman and his promotion. Um, I was hoping we'd get some clarity on that. I mean, do, did the IG see that? And if the IG didn't, the IG didn't see that, who's investigating it? Um, somebody clearly needs to. And how high did it go? Was it one supervisor who told him to change the report? Did that supervisor tell him to change it based on recommendations, recommendations of other supervisors? Is there any email trail in any of this? Um, the IG's report doesn't answer that. It deals with the issues systemically. Um, the, if the school board knows more, and it's possible they do, I don't think we've seen everything the school board's seen. Uh, maybe there's some other reasons or information they have that they're not sharing at this point. But I think that, you know, Dr. McKnight's entitled to know what they think the issues are and to, you know, to have a chance to respond. And, you know, if it's about broader issues, I want to remind everybody that most of the school policies that are causing a lot of angst of late are longstanding policies that were put in place before the superintendent and that were signed off by various school boards. So... I will, you know, if you look at the history of Dr. Starr, who, you know, was asked basically put out in the same way because the board wasn't supportive of the changes he wanted wanted to make because he didn't think the school system was as successful as it said it was. And it was not as successful as we claimed it was. Um, what message did that send to future superintendents? Don't try to change the system. If you try to change the system, we're going to get rid of you. Um, there are a lot of unanswered questions here, and I can't give you answers, but I can give you, a, these are my list of questions that I want people to address, you know, both in terms of the immediate problem was how do you, how did you handle this case? Of course, no mention of the other cases that MCPS submitted in the past. So you could say, how did you handle these cases? What do you plan on doing about that? And who was individually responsible for these decisions? It just can't be that the system all by itself created these horrible outcomes without people in the system making decisions to accept those kind of horrible outcomes. So I got questions, not all answered at this point. Thank you, Kyle. Do you have any follow-up questions for the county executive and or the officials? Uh, yeah? No, I'm good. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Members of the media, any other questions at this time, please your hand, raise your hand. No more questions? Going once and twice. I guess we're done for today. Thank you everybody for joining us. Stay safe, have a great afternoon. We'll see you next time. Thank you all.